All right, yeah, and welcome back to some more Magic Jewels. Uh, apologies for the lack of content yesterday. I feel like at this point that Magic starts on a Saturday these days, but yeah, we're back now. So we are going with a um, subscriber deck. I'm going to put your name right there uh, because I feel bad because I'm probably going to butcher it. So... Thank you to that individual for uh, sending me the deck list. This one's a little bit different from what I usually play. Mostly because it's not complete jank, jank or doesn't even try to be. It's a Esper control list essentially. So uh, what we want to do is essentially control the board and then swing in and ultimate things like our Liliana's. It could be Esper super friends which is also as you well know not something I usually go for but um, we're gonna try it today. We're gonna we're gonna see how good Esper Super Friends is in uh, the hands of a jank master. <laughs> so let's go right to the beginning, shall we? We've got Jace Vryn's Prodigy. This is one of the first planeswalkers we've got. Uh, two and a blue for a zero two, legendary creature, human wizard. So he allows us to tap, draw a card, and discard a card. And then this, if there's five or more cards in your graveyard, then you get to exile him, return to the battlefield, transformed as Jace Telepath Unbound. So a five, five loyalty planeswalker, he's plus one, up to one target creature gets minus two, minus zero until the end of the turn. We are quite a control deck, so there might literally be only one creature on the board at a time, so this is his way of protecting himself essentially. So if all's going well, Jace isn't going to be losing any loyalty because his plus one's going to be doing that for us. Uh, one of his best uh, abilities though that he does have is his minus three. You may cast target instant or sorcery from your graveyard this turn. If that card will be cast from your graveyard, exile it instead. So essentially we give flashback to one of our cards. Most of our cards are either for filtering, removal or countering. Uh, you won't be minusing for a counter unless you generally think that on your turn he's going to try counter you. But for the most part, we'll be flashing things back like our murders, like our anguished and makings, that kind of thing. Getting an extra use out of any card and essentially doubling them up in our hand, which is pretty cool. And then he's minus, which yet again probably won't be using, but if we do try to ultimate planeswalkers, then maybe we will be. It's not the end of the world. Um, and minus nine, you get an emblem with, whenever you cast a spell, target opponent puts the top five cards of his or her library into his graveyard. So this is a way that we can mill our opponent out, essentially. Uh, with control, games usually go on quite long, so he might be about a third the way through his deck by the time we're ultimating. So it's a long um, process to get rid of all of his cards, but it isn't out of the, uh, you know, it isn't out of the possibilities of actually happening, so that's one of his ultimates. We then have Blessed Alliance. This is a removal slash life gain slash uh, combat trick. So for one and a white instant speed, it does have Escalate. Uh, you get to choose one or more of these. Uh, you get to pick an extra one for every two more you pay. So the longer the game goes on, the more useful Blessed Alliance essentially becomes. So the first ability, target player gains four life. In an aggressive deck, this is pretty good. Um, untap two target creatures. So if we've got Kalatas on the battlefield, for example, or a Gear Hulk and we've just swung in, that kind of thing, we get to untap when our uh, opponent tries to swing in at our Planeswalkers, for example, and maybe take out a few creatures along the way. And then finally, target opponent sacrifices an attacking creature. So really good for aggressive decks. Really good if they're attacking in with just an Ulamog, for example. We can make them sacrifice it. So it gets rid of indestructible creatures that way. It's not the only way we can get rid of things like Ulamog, but that's one of the ways. It's not the best way either as well, because upon the attacking uh, trigger, Ulamog will be exiling half your deck, pretty much. We then have Telling Time, so for one and a blue instant speed, look at the top three cards of your library, put one of those cards into your hand, one on the top of your library, and one on the bottom. So essentially, we look at the three cards, we choose the two that we like the most, and we put the one on the bottom. So if we're mana screwed at the beginning, then we want to grab all of our lands, make sure that they're set up. We might want to just try find a counter spell, so we can go three cards deep to put the counter spell in our hand, and then a future really good card like a Gear Hulk on top of our library and get the throwaway card on the bottom so it's really good at filtering and allows us to set up our hand based on what our opponent's doing and by turn two if we're on the draw for example it's quite likely by turn two we can guess by their lands what they're trying to do so we can sort our hand out that way we then have grasp of darkness so for two black instant speed target creature gets minus four minus four until the end of the turn this gets around indestructible creatures though there aren't really many indestructible creatures that are this small but there are a few combat tricks that do it so 
Allowing a creature to get minus four, minus four is the way to get around that. That kills Kalatas. It kills a lot of white weenie creatures. Uh, Red Deck Winds has got a lot of low toughness creatures. So Grasp of Darkness hits most of the creatures that you really want to hit. And yeah, it's pretty good that way. We then have Scatter to the Winds. This is one of the ways of controlling the board. So um, before anything becomes a problem, we've got Scatter to the Winds. So for one and two blue, instant speed, counter target spell. It also has Awaken three. So not only can we counter, but if we pay six instead of three, then we get to turn one of our lands into a three three. We could put this on a man land as well, like our shambling vents, so that we can have a five six life linking land. Uh, we can't not turn it back into a land though, um, because it will be a creature land for the rest of the game. So it does open it up to removal, but the fact that we're running counters can help us get around that as well. So. This is one of the ways to close out the game if we have absolutely no board state to, do, um, to speak of. We then have Broken Concentration. Simply the same thing essentially for 1 and 2 blue, instant speed count, target spell. If our opponent makes us discard for any reason we can pay 4 to madness it out but that's just not likely to happen. We'd much rather counter whatever might be making us discard and that kind of thing. Then we have Murder, so for 1 and 2 black, instant speed, destroy target creature. Speaks for itself, it's just a hard casted removal spell with no conditions whatsoever. The only thing it doesn't get rid of is indestructible, indestructible creatures, but the only one that's really played these days is Ulamog. So we have instead, for Ulamog, Anguished Unmaking. So for one, a white and a black, instant speed, exile target, non-land permanent, you lose three life. So we're probably not taking much hits in terms of damage, so this three life isn't going to do us much harm. We do have Blessed Alliance to gain us 4 life later down the line as well. If we are kind of going up against a, a burn list, this can be a little bit uh, troublesome. But we have ways of gaining back life with our Kalatas, with our Blessed Alliance, that kind of stuff. So it's not too bad. This is a way of getting rid of things like uh, the Tutelage decks as well. We can exile their Sphinx's Tutelage and they can't get it back. We can kill Ulamog with this. We can pretty much just pick anything that's not a land. And remove it from the game to never worry about it. Also, Super Friends gets rid of Planeswalkers. Pretty sweet. Speaking of Planeswalkers, we then have Liliana, the Last Hope. So for one and two black, we have a three loyalty Planeswalker. Her first allows us to kill very small creatures and also protect herself if they've got two power, for example. So up to one target creature gets minus two, minus one until the end of the turn. So if he does have one toughness, like a lot of tokens do, like a lot of uh, red deck wins kind of creatures, we can kill a creature with our plus one, and uh, if they're a lot bigger than that, we can take the two power off them as well, which might just be enough to stop Liliana from taking any damage. If we get her down on turn three, then this plus one can be really useful for that kind of thing. A minus two is also pretty good in this deck. Put the top two cards of your library into your graveyard, then you re return a creature card from your graveyard to your hand. So we essentially, we mill two cards and then any creature that's in our graveyard, we can grab back. So creatures that might include Kalatas, which is really hard to deal with for your opponent. And, you know, with our murders in tow, he's really good. We'll get to him later though. We can pull back our Aversons, which is a board wipe if we have the right situation set up. And then we have our Linvalas to gain loads of life and our Gear Hulks to do lots of shenanigans. So her minus is actually really useful for that kind of stuff. And of course, if there isn't anything in there, we could maybe uh, top deck with the top two cards that might get us a better creature that we want. A minus seven, though, is what we're really aiming to do because it can end games. I have won through this before, so it's not an absolute ultimate you win the game kind of deal, but it is very, very hard to push through when it is actually in effect. So you get an emblem with, at the beginning of your end step, Put X 2-2 two, two zombie creatures onto the battlefield where X is 2 plus the number of zombies you control. So we, at the end of our turn, once we ultimate, we get 2 2 twos. Next turn, if none of our zombies die, then we get 4 2 twos, And then we get 6 2 twos on top of the zombies that we currently already have. So we can essentially just create a massive zombie wall. They do, of course, fold to languish, which is why they're quite easy to get through. And we don't have any really... We don't act any Israelis. <laughs> we don't have really any zombies to speak of other than the token generators. So the first time that this does generate them, we are going to get zombie tokens, just two of them, unless Kalatas has been doing some work. Speaking of, let's go to Kalatas. Kalatas, traitor of Get. So for two and two black, we have a 3-4 with lifelink. 
If a non-token creature an opponent controls would die, instead you exile it, which is a great way to get rid of any sort of graveyard shenanigans with our murders and stuff like that. We can hard cast our, um, our murder, kill something like a reanimator card, an omnath perhaps, and it, instead of going into the graveyard it will be exiled and we get a 2-2 black zombie instead, which is good. So we can go wide on the board just by removing our opponent's creatures. He then has the alternative ability of two and a black, sacrifice another vampire or zombie, and you get to put two 1-1 one -one counters on Kalatas. So Kalatas can get out of hand quite quickly this way, and with the lifelink it's really good to get out of the range of your opponent. If they're playing aggro and stuff like that, a 3-4 with lifelink is really bad, and aggro really wants to just push through and sacrifice the creatures just to get that final little bit of damage. Kalatas just stops that right in its tracks by gaining us the life that we need and any creatures that we block just end up turning into zombies which is just more blockers and it just it just spirals out of control for your opponent. No control deck is complete without a bit of card draw and this is our version. We've got Glimmer of Genius so for three and a blue instant speed we get to scry two, draw two and gain two energy. Now we don't have any use for the energy but the Scry 2 and Draw 2 is absolutely awesome in this deck, so this is why we're using it. If we're in blue, this is pretty much the, uh, the premier um, card draw spell. Because we get to essentially go four cards deep, depending on how good our top two cards were. So Scrying 2, we get to look at the top two cards. Depending on whether we like them or not, we can put them to the top or the bottom. And then we draw two. So theoretically, if we hit both on top, then we've gone four cards deep, so this might... You could call this a draw four, discard two kind of deal. It's that kind of stuff. Yeah, it depends on your perspective, of course. But Glimmer of Genius is a really awesome card draw spell that can be flashed back with our Jace and our Gear Hulk, which is somewhere halfway down there in the list. We then have Languish. So far, two and two black sorcery speed. All creatures get minus four, minus four until the end of the turn. This is a great board wipe. It's not the best board wipe, but in black it absolutely is. So for um, for four mana, we can wipe our opponent's board, get minus four, minus four. If we've got Kalatas out at the time as well, we can get a load of zombies for wiping their board, which is pretty awesome. So yeah, it speaks for itself really. It's just a massive board wipe. We then have Gideon, ally of Zendikar. So for two and two white, we have a four loyalty planeswalker. So the first thing you do when you get Gideon down, for the most part, is do his zero cast. So we're going to talk about that one first. For zero loyalty, you get to put a 2-2 white knight ally token onto the battlefield. This is his way of protecting himself. This is usually the first thing you do in the game. If you're playing proper magic where you've got four cards, though, some people tend to just ultimate him immediately. But we don't really have the luxury of that because we can't get him back once we've done that. So once we've got our zero cast out, the next turn when he doesn't have summoning sickness, we can do the plus one ability and make him a 5-5 five five, uh, human soldier ally with indestructible that cannot be dealt damage, essentially. So it's a really good way of forcing your opponent to block. And yet again, with a Kalatas out, having a 5-5 five five coming at you that can't be destroyed in very many ways is pretty awesome. And then once we've gotten to five loyalty, we can maybe afford to do the minus four ability. You get an emblem with creatures you control, get plus one, plus one. I wouldn't particularly recommend doing this though, because we don't really have that many creatures. We kind of want to clear our opponent's board, put down one really good creature, like a Torrential Gear Hulk, for example, and just swing in and make sure the board's clear for those final hits. So you're not going to be using this very much. Uh, you probably want to go wide with the ally tokens instead and maybe plussing with Gideon as well to force through a little bit of extra damage. So his ultimate's not too useful in this deck, but in the right situations, it is pretty good. We then have Archangel Avacyn, so for 3 and 2 white, Flash Flying Vigilance Angel for 4. So that means we can essentially cast it whenever we want. And when it enters the battlefield, all of our creatures gain indestructible until the end of the turn. So if our opponent tries to planar outburst our torrential gear hulks and our ally tokens away, we flash in Avacyn and they all gain indestructible. It's also a great, a great way if they're attacking with all of their creatures for us to make some profitable blocks because suddenly all of our creatures can't die. So we might as well block with absolutely everything. When a non-angel creature you control dies, however, transform Archangel Everson at the beginning of the next upkeep. So we can use this to our advantage, and it can also be to our detriment sometimes. Um, because 
when she flips into Amazon the Purifier, uh, when she transforms, it deals three damage to each other creature and each opponent. So everybody but Avison and us gets dealt three damage. So if we have gone wide with our zombie tokens from our Liliana ultimate and our ally tokens, they're going to die. However, we do get a 6-5 with flying. Does no longer have vigilance though, so that's got to be better. you got to bear that in mind a little bit. But for the most part, you're probably going to be wiping the board with Avison right here. So she's pretty awesome. We then have Planar Outburst, the best removal spell. Because uh, it kills everything. So for 3 and 2 white, sorcery speed, destroy all non-land creatures. And it also has Awaken 4 as well. So if we pay 5 and 3 white, we can turn one of our lands into a 4-4 four, four elemental creature for the rest of the game. And it comes in straight after the board wipe. So that is 4 damage if we pay for the Awaken cost right out the gate. And they have no removal of course. So we've only got one of them because we're also running Tragic Arrogance. So this is kind of a board wipe, but also not. Great for super friends if they've gone a bit wide and we haven't. So for three and two white, sorcery speed, each player, you choose among them the permanents that that player controls. You take an artifact, a creature, an enchantment, and a planeswalker, and they only get to keep one of each of those things. We can use this um, to our advantage with the Kaladesh set because artifact creatures exist. So we can select artifact and creature on the same one. And then we can wipe the rest of them. So if they have a Gear Hulk and we don't really mind, we can pick the Gear Hulk as an artifact and the Gear Hulk as a creature. And they get rid of all of their artifacts and creatures then, other than that one, of course. We can also get rid of multiple tutelages if they've got that, maybe um, some retreats and stuff like that. And if they've gone wide with the Planeswalkers, we get to choose one that they get to keep and maybe we can swing in and kill it. So we can, we can sort of board wipe with this. But yeah, they sacrifice all of those permanents and then we get to benefit. So we we get to pull the trigger on this. So it's whenever it suits us as well. So if we've gone wide with a ton of creatures, we probably don't want to be doing tragic arrogance unless we're going to die if we don't. So it's really good for that. We then have Jace, Unraveler of Secrets. So for three and two blue, five loyalty planeswalker. He's plus one. You get to scry one and draw a card. So you get to go two cards deep with this one essentially. You get to look at the top card. If you like it, you draw it. If you don't, then you get the next one, which is really awesome, especially with control when we start getting the cards that we really want every single turn. It's really hard to get under the uh, under the boot of control once that starts happening. It's pure card advantage as well. So, And his ultimate is pretty good, so if you can aim to that, pretty awesome. His minus two is his way of protecting himself, so minus two, return target creature to its owner's hand. We can't be doing this forever, and our opponent can, of course, recast it, but if it is a token, then it's not coming back, and if it's expensive, then we're kind of forcing our opponent to spend a turn recasting that creature, and maybe we have a uh, counter spell open for it when it comes back down as well. So it's really cool. We can set this up for whenever it suits us as well. For minus eight, this is the ultimate, so you get an emblem with it. Whenever opponent casts his or her spell, each turn you get to counter that. So we only have to then, once we've ultimated, counter the second spell, if it even matters. Which usually means that your opponent is going to cast a throwaway card to trigger the emblem, and then he's going to cast the one that matters, and that's the one that we're going to counter. So it's pretty awesome. Once this is happening, it's... It's really hard to win and you, you essentially have to play two cards every turn and you're only getting one card out of it that might just immediately get removed. So Jace can win the game by himself once he's ultimated just off that alone. We then have Obnixilus. Yet again, this is another way to draw cards and get the advantage that we need. So for three and a black, five loyalty planeswalker. Same as Jace but in black essentially. It's plus one. You draw a card and lose one life. So there's no scry ability on here, and we do lose one life. However, he's, he's just pretty good, and he's he's uh, first minus. I would say he's arguably better than uh, Jace is. Minus three, destroy target creature. Speaks for itself, really. And he's minus eight. Target opponent gets an emblem with whenever a player draws a card, you lose two life. So once we've ultimated Obnixilus, it's a four point life swing every single cycle, which is pretty sweet. So yeah, Obnixilus, awesome. We then have Linvala the Preserver, so for 4 and 2 white, 5-5 five, five flying legendary angel. Whenever it enters the battlefield, if your opponent has more life than you, then you gain 5 life. 
If your opponent has more creatures than you, then you gain a 3-3 white angel. So she can really do a lot of stuff. It's situational when you want to play her because you do want to get both um, abilities out. But if it really helps just to have a 5-5 flyer on the battlefield, then you can neglect the second ability. And for the most part, we have a lot of spells that are going to be dealing ourselves some damage as well. And we won't really be dealing a great deal of damage to our opponent until the later half of the game. So Linvala's first ability is probably going to be in, in effect more times than it's not. So she's really good for that. And we do have ways of pulling her back, of course, with our Liliana, which is pretty sweet. We then have Torrential Gear Hulk. So for 4 and 2 blue, 5, 6 with flash. So we can use it as a combat trick to block one of our opponent's creatures. And also, when it enters the battlefield, you may cast a target instant card from your graveyard without paying its mana cost. If that card will be put into your graveyard this turn, exile it instead. So it's essentially a uh, snapcaster. It gives a, a card flashback in your graveyard equal to its mana cost. So Torrential Gear Hulk can come down, block a creature and kill it. And we can also maybe flashback an Anguish done making to kill a Planeswalker, or a Murder to kill a creature, or even a Glimmer of Genius to draw cards, or even a Counterspell. So Torrential Gear Hulk has got many applications in this deck, so it's all about setting up the perfect time. But a Gear Hulk into Glimmer of Genius to draw two cards straight after can just seal the game by itself. Because you can just draw into loads of counters. You've got a 5-6 on the battlefield. You've probably just killed one of their creatures. So you end up having this board state that your opponent can't get out of for at least a couple of turns. While your counters are running low and your board wipes and stuff like that. Really awesome. Unfortunately it's mythic so we only have the one of them. So we're not going to see it every match. But when we do see it it's likely to be very useful to us. We then have Noxious Gear Hulk. So for 4 and 2 black a 5-4 with Menace. So it's hard to block. And it does a fair amount of damage. And when it enters the battlefield, you may destroy another creature an opponent controls. If a creature is destroyed this way, then you gain life equal to its toughness. So this is a 6 mana removal spell with a 5-4 menace attached. Menace essentially means that two creatures have to block it in order for it to uh, not get through to your opponent. So we can probably kill two creatures if they really want to block it. But for the most part, we're killing one on its way in. So it could be a 5-4 unblockable for quite a fair amount of the game, which is awesome. We then have, finally, a Sorin Grim Nemesis. So for 4, a white and a black, we have a 6 loyalty planeswalker. It's one of my favourite planeswalkers, just because of the sheer amount of um, power that it can give you. So it's plus 1, is sheer card advantage. So if I reveal the top card of your library and put that card into your hand, essentially draw a card without the words draw. So it doesn't trigger um, Obnixilis's ultimate, just so you're aware. Because it has to say draw in order to do that. So we reveal the top card and put it into our hand. And then each opponent loses life equal to its converted mana cost. You may notice we've got a lot of high converted mana cost cards. So Sorin can actually do up to 6 damage with this plus 1 right off the bat. This is a great way of killing your opponents. We can of course whiff by hitting lands which would do 0 because they don't have a mana cost. But for the most part, we're going to be hitting high curve creatures that will then be playing for a little bit more advantage as well. So he's really awesome. He could win the game by himself just um, through the advantage that he provides. His minus X ability is one of my favorites. Soaring Grim Nemesis deals X damage to target creature or planeswalker and you gain X life. So what I like to do when I play Soaring, it depends on the situation of course. When he comes down, if your opponent's got a planeswalker on the field you can probably kill it with Sorin. So I like to minus 5 Sorin and deal 5 damage to either a creature or a planeswalker and gain 5 life. And then I've usually got either removal spells or board wipes or something like that to keep Sorin safe so that I can plus 1 him until I might want to do the minus X again to kill another planeswalker. He's minus 9. Haven't actually pulled it off before but I have seen it been done and it's pretty great. Put a number of 1-1 one, one black vampire knight creature tokens with lifelink onto the battlefield equal to the highest life total among all players. So whoever has the most life, that's how many 1-1 uh, one, one lifelinking creatures we get. It's pretty awesome and the fact that it's gaining so much lifelink is just chump blockers for days which could allow us to stabilize if we haven't already. If we're ultimating Sorin, we've probably stabilized or even won. Which is why it's kind of a win more ultimate. but And that's why you kind of don't see it these days. Because 
if you if you've managed to plus one Sorin to the point where you can ultimate him, you've probably dealt a fair amount of damage uh, if you've set up the deck to be doing that kind of thing. So it's not going to be used too often, but it can win the game. It could be like up to thirty creatures if your opponent's playing life gain and that kind of thing. So pretty sweet. Onto the mana base, we've got four planes, four islands, and four swamps. We then have Shambling Vent. So for uh, Shambling Vent is a white black land that enters the battlefield tapped. And for one, a white and a black. Shambling Vent becomes a 2 3 white and black elemental creature token. Uh, creature. Yeah, just a creature, sorry. With lifelink, and it is still a land. So destroy non land permanent and stuff like that still don't affect Shambling Vent when it becomes a creature. Which um, is actually quite useful. But this is a way of protecting our planeswalkers. It's also a way of gaining back our life and stopping um, aggro decks like Red Deck Wins in their tracks just by gaining the life that they're trying to swing in with and killing their creatures in the process. So Shambling Vent can pull the game out right when you really need it to, which is pretty sweet. That's why we've got two copies. We then have Sunken Hollow. This is an island swamp. And it enters the battlefield tapped unless you control two or more basic lands. So we do have 12 basics in here, so it's quite likely that these are going to enter the battlefield untapped when we need them to. Or at the very least, we'll put it down on turn 1 when it's not really necessary. Prairie Stream, essentially the same thing except for it's a Plains Island instead. And enters the battlefield tapped unless you control two or more basic lands. Then we move on to the Czech lands, which are absolutely great. I think they're called Buddy Lands in paper. I don't know, I can never keep track of the actual names of all of the... The lands. I know man lands and check lands and fetch lands, that kind of thing, but I can never put the uh, the name to the card itself. I think these are buddy lands because they come into play tapped unless you control a different land of a specific type. In this case, island or swamp, which island or swamp is sunk and hollow. These two can go in synergy with each other, which is pretty awesome. We then have isolated chapel, which is a white black land that is exactly the same, but needs a plains or a swamp instead. And a Glacial Fortress that needs a Plains or an Island instead. Well, that's going to be the deck, guys. Be sure to check out the matches that should be following shortly after. If you do have any suggestions for the deck, uh, I'm happy to hear them in the comments section below. So be sure to do that. And as always, be sure to leave a like. If you did enjoy the content, it helps me out a great deal. It lets me know you're still enjoying the series, like the look of the deck and all that jazz. Subscribe if you haven't already for more matches. We're going to be putting one out every single day for the next three days on this deck alone. So be sure to subscribe for that if you haven't already. And as always, if you're not sure about subscribing, stay for the end card, see the rest of the content I've got to offer, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.